Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark in the New Testament, chapter 10, verses 17 through 27. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. This is God's word. We're in a series talking about spiritual vision in the middle section of the Gospel of Mark, beginning and end of this extended narrative or healings of blind people. In between are all these examples of people who are struggling to see spiritually. And today, a startling encounter a man has with Jesus that reveals the blinding power of money. And yet, look closely enough, it's not just about money. What do we learn? Three lessons. A lesson about life, a lesson about loss, and a lesson about love. First, a lesson about life. Just think about who this man was. Mark tells us here that he had great wealth. Uh, But this same story is also told in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Luke tells us that he was a ruler. Matthew tells us that he was a young guy, the rich young ruler. This guy had it all by worldly standards. And, uh, you know, he was he was wealthy. He was powerful and he was a young guy. He had the world by the tail. And I'm sure there were moments in his life where he thought, If I can just get these things, then I'll have it all. I will have arrived. But then he must have also hit a point where he was like, self, is this what life is really cracked up to be? Is this all there is? There is this emptiness evidently in him. And, you know, you and I might be tempted, if you've heard this story before, to right up front be critical of this individual. But I think it's important to be empathetic, first of all, and actually appreciate some things that are important here. Because though most of us would probably not describe ourselves in the categories of this man having it all, we get it, right? We know that sense. Sometimes it's lingering. For some of us, it's there right now. That sense of emptiness that's aching, that there's got to be more beyond everything that constitutes life for us at this point. And then he hears about this new rabbi that's passing through town. Maybe he's got the answer. He ran up to him, Mark tells us, and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Notice he's passionate, he's respectful, and he's eager. Eager for something more than this life. He's interested in eternal life. He's what we might call a spiritual seeker. And I think it's something to admire in the man, to be able to be courageous enough, uh, humble enough, insightful enough to recognize a person's spiritual need and to be honest about it to yourself and then to seek after Jesus as a help. I think it's an absolutely beautiful thing. That's the first quick lesson, a lesson about life. Secondly, a lesson about loss. Nevertheless, this man is a vivid example of spiritual blindness and Jesus wastes no time in addressing it. Instead of 
answering the question the man posed to him, what must I do, good teacher, to inherit eternal life, Jesus questions the questioner. His basic assumption, the way that he addressed him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Undoubtedly, this is a man who was used to getting his way. He knew how, he knew where the buttons were in life and he knew how to push them in order to get what he needed. And surely in this instance, what he lacked, quality of life, eternal life, he could get if he just mustered up his own competencies and applied himself. Jesus presses him further. You know the commands, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal. And the guy's like, I've kept these since I was a little boy. Check, check, check. And then Jesus says, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Can you just imagine what this guy's feeling? Look, I have played by the rules. Um, I have succeeded at all of these rules. I've kept all these, what are you talking about? And there's no command, Jesus, about having to give up all your money anyway. It says in verse 22, most poignant phrase of this story, at this the man's face fell, he went away sad because he had great wealth. The word sad is putting it too mildly, actually. It's better translated grieve. This man was grieving a great loss. Jesus had exposed his blindness. He claimed to have kept all the law. And yet what Jesus, by putting this before him, by pressing him in this way, what he does is he exposes the fact that he really didn't understand more than the surface of the law. And he missed the heart of the very first of the commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. See, this man might have said, I feel confident that if you went to his home, you would not have find, found a shrine where he was bowing down and worshiping some foreign idol. He would have probably said, I believe in the God of Abraham, and Jacob. And yet, at the, at the controlling center of his life, what really kindled his affections was money and all that it could bring to him. He didn't love the Lord his God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength, which both the Old and New Testament says is really the essence of the law. He needed God. God was a business partner, not his Lord. God was a means to him accomplishing his end. And he built his life, his sense of who he was, his identity around all of this. Tim Keller, reflecting on this, said, when Jesus called this young man to give up his money, the man started to grieve because money was for him the center of his identity. To lose his money would have been to lose himself. For you and me, this may hit us square in the face. This may actually be exactly what we struggle with, what has become too much the center of our identity, our spiritual core, money, and all that it represents. For others of you, you're sitting there thinking, this is really not my issue. But don't you see, this story is begging us to see that it's about money and it's a lot, about a lot more than money. It's about anything, and the list is legion, that can occupy that place of control in our heart where our hearts are captivated by it. God may be out on the periphery of our life, not quite yet jettisoned, but he's at a controlling distance for us. So what is that thing for you? What has become your identity? What is it that you don't want to lose, but Jesus is saying you've got to lose. You must lose if you don't want to lose what is infinitely more valuable. Well, as if Jesus hadn't been provocative enough, as this man is walking away grieving, it becomes a teaching point for his disciples. And this is where he says one, is, one of his more famous and provocative and memorable comments that he's ever made. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. A camel was the largest land animal in Palestine at the time. 
the eye of a needle was the smallest hole imaginable at the time. The point is it's utterly impossible. It's hyperbolic in a sense because of course, plenty of rich people throughout history have made it into the kingdom. So it's not utterly impossible, but really what's the point? It's impossible, just as impossible as a camel passing through the eye of a needle if a person's assumption is they can enter in the hard wiring way that rich people tend to be, tend to think. That, and, and frankly, by historic and global standards, a large portion of us in this room and watching online would fall into the category of wealthy. Because money has a blinding capacity in two ways, blinding us as to what our spiritual need is, thinking that we have the resources, we have the competencies to be able to get what we need, as opposed to the startling truth that we are spiritually bankrupt. It also blinds us to our utter need for Jesus as savior. That we don't need Jesus as a good teacher only. We don't need him as a manager of our life, a consultant far less. We need him as our Lord, our God, and our Savior. Our need is not partial, in other words, but total. It's a lesson about life, a lesson about loss, a lesson about love. You know, Jesus' startling response to the man you, you might hear it and you go, gosh, Jesus, I mean, that's not very kind. It might strike you as particularly cold, but it actually couldn't have been further from the truth. In fact, unlike so many other encounters where you go, oh my goodness, that's a hard teaching, Jesus. Mark prefaces this statement by Jesus to this man with the way he was feeling. It says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. See, it turns out Jesus loved is actually what led him to expose the man's spiritual blindness. Not to have done so would have been unloving for him. And unlike you and me, Jesus always knew precisely the best tactic to use when interacting with someone. And he gauged that in this instance, tough love is what was needed to open this man's eyes so that he could begin to actually see. And yes, this man went away from Jesus sad, grieving, but we don't know how the story ends. It's a bit of a cliffhanger at that point. Might just be, this man was young, that this might have been a turning point in his life. This encounter that he had with this good teacher, this man that he saw is merely a good teacher. Because of course, Jesus is far more than a good teacher. If you think about it, Jesus is another example of a rich young ruler. And yet the degree of wealth and power and status that he had was infinitely greater than this man. You remember when I said earlier that the word for sad is better translated grieve. One of the reasons I think that's so is that this same word in Greek is used in another place in the New Testament applying to Jesus. It's the night before Jesus died. He's in the garden of Gethsemane. He is in absolute distress, says sweating drops of blood. And he is, it says, grieving. Why? Because he knows that he's about to face the ultimate loss, that he is about to lose his source of joy his center, his basic identity on the cross as he bore our sin, as he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus would somehow lose his father. All of that to gain you and me. Now, what's impossible for humans as impossible as a camel passing through the eye of a needle is utterly possible with God through 
the gift, the free gift of his sheer grace for us in Jesus Christ. And when that love captivates our hearts, it'll begin to displace the controlling power of money and all other substitute gods in our life. And absolutely, we'll continue to struggle throughout life, but more and more we'll begin to see with this love captivating us, that these things aren't so much our identity anymore. They're not our default for who we are, our security, our inheritance. And remarkably giving up these things that have blinded us will increasingly seem like less of a loss to us because with fresh eyes, we're in a position to behold the supreme treasure. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the gift that you have given to us in your son. And Lord, as the ancient hymn has put it, so we pray to you, riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always, thou and thou only first in my heart, High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. Amen.